are you? Good. How are you this morning? of the glory of God, 
by the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Moment 
where um, you are being too noisy, right? Are there times where we need our inside voices or we need to be quieter? Can you think of when those would be? Joy, can you think of one? When would you need to use your quiet voice or your inside voice? When your dad's working, that's a good time to be quiet, yes. Lance? Yeah, because of work, right? Mm -hmm. So when somebody's sleeping, it's good to be quiet, yeah. And maybe when your teacher's teaching, right, and, or another classmate is speaking and answering a question, anytime anybody else is talking, it's good to be quiet and to think about when it's our turn to talk. But then sometimes something's really important. We have a really important message or a really urgent message. And it would be really frustrating if we got shushed in the middle of that, wouldn't it? Would be, right? It's like, ah, you need to hear this. Come on. So today we're going to hear about somebody who really wanted to talk with Jesus. And the people around him were saying shush. They thought Jesus was too important. They didn't want him to make noise or make a ruckus. But Jesus really wanted to hear what he had to say. And he helped him. So, anytime that we're trying to call out to Jesus, it's okay to be a little noisy, to call out for help, to ask for what's right, to count on God to, um, to hear us, right, when we, when we cry out to him. So, yes, there are times when we should be quiet, but there are times where it's really, really important to shout out for help and shout out things about love and mercy and grace and peace. Right. Should we say a prayer? Jesus, thank you for our voices. Thank you we can use them to shout out to you and that you hear us. Help us to proclaim important things, things that change the world, things about love and mercy and grace. Amen. lesson is from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. The northern tribes of Israel had been lost in exile to Assyria more than a century before Jeremiah prophesied. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 7 through 9. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, sing O Lord your people the remnant of Israel. See I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor. Together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come, and with consolations, I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in, sh in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is from the seventh chapter of Hebrews. Jesus is God's son, the holy, sinless, resurrected high priest. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the Lord, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. 
their stories discarded, their voices unheard, and their needs brushed aside. Well, maybe those standing close to Bartimaeus on the side of the road were afraid that Jesus would think they were with him and wonder why they couldn't do a better job of just keeping him in control. Too late. Way to go. Jesus is looking their way. How embarrassing. But no, wait. Could it be? Jesus is calling for the bystanders to call Bartimaeus to him. The ones who were telling Bartimaeus to shush and be quiet and settle down are now the ones sending Bartimaeus out to the front and center. Take heart, they tell him. Get up. Jesus is calling you. Except here, really, the best translation is not heart. See, the word heart in Greek, cardios, right? The actual heart. Um, we know that. Cardiologists, right? I go cardiogram, all those different um, words in medicine that we use cardio for. But that's not the word that the, the gospel writer uses here. It's a different word. And the best translation for that word is courage. Have courage. Get up. He is calling you. Interesting, really, because I think Bartimaeus has shown his courage already. In fact, he shows courage every day sitting by the side of the road, waking up each day confronting the difficulties that he experiences, facing the reality that to live, he must beg. And today, as Jesus passed by him, having the courage to call out to Jesus, to call out to him by name, and boldly give him the title meant for the Messiah. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now maybe it's just a variation on his daily cry from the roadside. Maybe he usually says, good neighbor, have mercy on me. But his courage stands in contrast to the bystanders and their fear. Only when Jesus responds do they all come on board. For really, truly, life was still no picnic for those gathered along the side of the road watching along with Bartimaeus for Jesus. They may not be blind like Bartimaeus, but they were still poor. They were still Jews living under Roman oppression. They had the same worries to put food on their table. But with Bartimaeus in their midst, maybe just then they can forget their struggles. Hey, at least we don't have to beg like Bartimaeus. And so, an alternative to facing the daily reality of their hard and unforgiving world, well, the crowd chose denial, and they shush. Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus' courage is causing a ruckus. It's disrupting the norm. It draws attention to his needs for mercy and therefore draws attention to them realizing their own needs for mercy. We get calls to the church on a regular basis from people looking for some kind of assistance. And the range of need really is all across the board, and, and it's increasing. I feel like, honestly, about a week ago, I felt like somebody was on the corner handing out my phone number. There were so many calls. Some people need a place to stay. Some people need some groceries. Some people need a way to keep their lights on or put gas in their car. I wonder what the courage is that it takes to dial that phone number. To tell your story again and again, to show your vulnerability, to ask for help, and to face the no that you will most likely get on the other end of the line. There's a script that I and other pastors follow. Have you been in contact with the agencies downtown? What about Waypoint in the Acumen Medical Center? Have you tried the food bank? There's lots of places you can get a meal. Explaining as gently as I can that we support those agencies financially so that they can provide better services than, than we as a church could ever provide in those situations. Inevitably, I will hear from the caller that they have been to some of those places and they were told that the funds had already run low for the month and to try again. I know it's true. Even with our support, even with the support of other faith communities, the immediate need is greater than the resources that these agencies have to offer. It's like Bartimaeus calling out in need, have mercy on me. 
With a lot of these conversations, there's a little bit of an extra sense I've developed that sort of kicks in. I trust that there's more, it's really more than a sense, but perhaps the Holy Spirit nudging me along to serve in one way or another. I've ended many a phone conversation with, sorry, I can't help you with this problem. And then I trust and then I pray that God's mercy will come to them from somewhere if it didn't come through Gloria Day. But now and again, and more often than it has been, due to the blessing of what we know as the love fund, mercy does come to that person in need through all of you. And whatever that need might be, it always has to be direct help for a specific need. It's not, we're not handing out cash. But with that little boost of help, that little act of mercy, well, perhaps the person goes back out with courage, back into the hard reality of what they face, but with more hope. Daily, our own courage is tested in a different way. Will we take the step out of our comfort zone? Will we listen to the voices that are crying for mercy? Do we have the courage to not only show mercy in the moment of urgent need, but to make changes that create an overall more merciful world. A world that doesn't have racism or sexism or ageism or homophobia or great economic divides or partisan stalemates. Faith and courage have an interesting relationship. Faith breeds courage, but it also requires courage at the same time. Church, church with a big C, capital C, as we've known it all our whole lives, it's entered a new age that will require courage and risk. And some of those risks, by God's grace, will come out okay and we'll be able to build on them. And some of those risks will fall short. We might fail, but we'll learn and we'll grow. And then, by God's grace, we will try again. Grace is ultimately the source of our courage. Trusting, staking our lives on grace is what gives us courage to move into that unknown territory, to follow where it is that Jesus leads us. This could be actual unknown territory, or it could just be the same old territory that we enter into in a new, untested way with new partners in the gospel. We move into either instance, probably still afraid, but refusing to be in denial, choosing to rely on God being bigger than our fear. Courage paired with faith and undergirded by grace. Courage paired with faith and undergirded by grace. We need it as disciples that are called by Jesus. We need it as citizens, as neighbors, as employees, as students, as members of families. There are new roads ahead. And we will no doubt need this courage as we discern how God is calling us in our daily lives and how God is calling us as the body of Christ serving in the world. Can we show courage that is born of faith and trust that God's grace is always ours? As gracious, loving, and merciful as God is, surely our courage can be stretched. We are at heart an Easter people. Being raised out of death ultimately leads us into new and uncharted territory. And no question, we will bear a few scars, we will grieve some losses, but the promise is always new life. And we take these leaps of faith together. Succeed, trial, fail, try again. God's grace, Jesus' mercy, is guaranteed. So have courage, get up. He is calling you. There's a prayer in our hymnal called the Prayer for Good Courage, and I offer it to you now. Let us pray. O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
join together with the whole church and we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the everlasting. Amen. Set free from sin and death, and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. Loving Jesus, grant that your grace will be the foundation of our faith and our courage to serve a world that cries out for mercy. Help us to hear voices that have been silenced and pushed aside. And in so doing, may we be humble enough to recognize our own deep need for you as our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Holy One, we give you thanks for generous land that produces abundant harvests. Strengthen and protect all soils and rooftop gardens and prairie farmlands, patio planters and the fertile valleys. And bless all those who lovingly tend them. Lord, in your mercy. Ruling One, we give you thanks for leaders of nations who work to build up the common good. Strengthen efforts of reconciliation among all nations and peoples that peace extends in every direction. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Healing one, we give you thanks for all who labor for the health of others. Comfort and strengthen all who struggle with chronic pain. Send healing and relief to all who are sick, all who are recovering from surgery. Lord, we lift before you on the structures of our prayers, all those for whom prayer is requested on our Gloria Day prayer chain, and all those we name before you now, silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Providing one, we give you thanks for all who provide for others, inspire generosity in your people, so that we carry out the work of making disciples of all nations. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Living one, we give you thanks for the saints who have increased our faith. Give us courage to follow and hope until you gather us all around your table of abundance. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and our life. Amen. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the 
gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. about every five to six years. And it's been about... 